This is the Relentless Pursuit of Winning podcast. My name is Rick Meekins. I'm the managing partner at Epiphany Business Consulting and your host for today. I am so delighted to have you in the studio. Thank you for being here. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell so you can be notified every time we drop a new episode. Now let's get it started. All right, guys, we have Susan Schmidt Bryant in the studio today. How are you today? I'm doing great, Rick. Thanks so much for having me on your show. I've been waiting for this. This is going to be awesome. It's going to be, let's talk all things accounting tax, how to make your business more profitable, how to save money on taxes. I mean, I don't, this stuff gets me fired up. Uh, it sounds like <laughs> it. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Susan, can you tell our audience a little bit about you? Absolutely. Um, so I'm a CPA. I'm a certified tax planner. I am uh, been either a business owner or working with business owners for 20 something years, which is kind of hard to say out loud. And my specialty, <laughs> no, right. yeah, no, right? Like, how did that happen? Like, went by really fast. <laughs> uh, my specialty is really helping business owners to maximize profits, uh, right. optimize their tax strategies so they can keep more money working for them so that they could in turn make more profits. And kind of the overarching um, mission for all of that work is to preserve and protect the entrepreneurial wealth that they're building. So that is what we focus on. And that takes many different forms, but that's really the thing that yeah. is like, I think believe that's the mission of my life. Uh, that's the thing that's oh. near and dearest to my heart. I love helping entrepreneurs to take what they have already started to create and make it even better and find all these tips, tricks, things that they don't know how to apply, like maybe the tools in the toolbox, how to apply them to their business so it can be yeah. even better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a conversation um, that often happens. You know, it's just like, okay, I'm making money, but, you know, it's like I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> you know what I mean? How, how did you get into this? What was your, what was your journey like? Um, like backwards. You know, have you ever seen that Facebook uh, meme where it's like success and like people expect it to be like a straight line, straight up, right? But really what it is is like, oh, yeah. part of my thing. <laughs> okay, so um, when I was um, in high school, I was voted most likely to succeed, which was a great honor. I was really excited to receive this honor. Um, but then I didn't get admitted into the UT Business School on my first try. And I was like, what? This is like wrong. So I went through the process of like getting all these letters of recommendation, and all this stuff. And I I got in and I started a, a pursuing a degree in marketing, and mm -hmm. that sounds that sounds marketing. so. It doesn't sound like accounting. <laughs> you know, right? Like it's like those two things don't don't sound the same. They don't mean the same thing. Uh, but I started right. taking accounting classes because uh, the people in the career center said, "Susan, you will get a good job." if you have more hours of accounting and um, I could hear my mother in my ear saying, Susan, you need a good job. When you get like, we're paying for four <laughs> years of college, you must have a good job coming out of college. So, so I said, all right, I'm going to take some accounting hours. And then I just kind of fell in love with accounting. Um, it's wow. just like one of those things where it's like, you don't know what you don't know until you start doing it. And I just loved it. Yeah. So I just kept doing more and more and more and more and more. Unfortunately, at that particular time, I went to UT in Austin and they didn't have anything like a double major or there was no such thing. So I uh -huh. just got a bunch of accounting hours and I said, I'm going to sit for the CPA exam one day and I'll, I'm going to pass it. I'll look it up. And, um, that's that's kind of what I did. So I am like the weirdest CPA because I don't even have a degree in accounting. Oh wow! Oh wow! So you so you finished the degree in marketing and then you sat for the CPA exam at some point. Yeah, I did. Um, I my first job out of college, I was an internal auditor for Bank One. Um, I had been uh -huh. a bank teller all during um, part of high school and all during college, and so banking just seemed okay. like a natural transition. And then um, I yeah. went on to take the CPA exam and I passed it. I think it was. Maybe I was like 24 when I passed it. I passed all four parts on my first try. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, 17 weeks of my life studying, doing that, you know, like working and doing that. That's pretty much it. And, um, and then I decided to get into public accounting. I went to work at a super small firm where it was like the partner and me. And I did mm -hmm. everything, right? So I <laughs> said, Susan, um, figure it out. And so I'm, I'm a self-starter. I like figuring out like a jigsaw puzzle person. I love figuring out how things all fit together. 
So yeah. public accounting yeah. has been like a big giant jigsaw puzzle for me. And along the way, yeah. learning yeah. how business yeah. business owners think and feel. I mean, every business is like a giant jigsaw puzzle, how it all works together. To me, that's the most exciting part about a business is figuring out how to make it work perfectly. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's interesting, um, you know, again, you know, just, just thinking in terms of, you know, being that business owner, working with lots of business owners, it's, it's like, you know, you focus on doing what you do. You know, you focus on, you know, accounting, you know, other folks, hey, I'm a marketing person, I'm this and that, this and that. And it's almost, it's almost like sometimes, you know, the, the money aspect of it, you know, almost, almost gets in the way, you know, it's, it's certainly building that financial structure, building that financial operation isn't really, you know, that first and foremost thing that you're thinking about. You know, how, how do you, so when you're working with a company, I mean, how do you, how do you start to like, you know, dig in? I mean, where do you start? Oh, we let curiosity lead the way. Um, the beginning part for anything in the, fin- the the world of a business from a financial perspective is to always look at their accounting records, of course. It tells a lot about the business. It tells a lot about the business owner's priorities, um, where they have focused. Uh, it lends itself to not only understanding, you know, spending and cash flow, but um, how things are priced, um, mm-hmm. their, their their revenue structure and model, their mix, um, where they invest yeah. their yeah. money, whether that's employees or equipment. So the accounting is really the beginning piece. Generally, yeah. and I think you, Rick, you probably see this a lot or talk to a lot of business owners where they struggle with uh, what accounting records or, yeah, I think I <laughs> updated those like maybe like, mm, I don't know, three months ago, six months ago. Like I did that from last year's taxes. And that's the piece that holds a lot of people back is it's hard to do any of the proactive stuff that people really, really want in their financial lives until that piece gets fixed. So um, there's a lot of, you know, accounting is a discipline, just like so many other things in a business. It's just a discipline. Yep. Yep. You know, I, I, I thought you were going to, you know, how do you, how do you set up your pricing? You know, because that's that's that other piece. You know, it's just like, oh well, I'm making more than I spend, but <laughs> right. I'm always surprised by the number of people who haven't changed their prices or evaluated their prices or or just or use their imagination to say, well, just because I've been doing it this way, maybe since the beginning of my business, is this the best way to do it? Is there another way to mm. do it? Could I be mm. doing things differently to encourage people to? buy my services or products differently. I think we lose a lot of our imagination when we when we grow up, right? So we forget to be creative and innovative along the way. Yeah. Or we just kind of get in a rut. You know, it's like those narrow pathway ruts or just like that. This is just the path of least resistance. Just go that way. And um, it's this nice what to I know. This is what I keep doing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you just keep coming back and saying like, if I could just start over, what would it look like, right? So um, that doesn't mean you have to start over. It just means like if you could, if you didn't have to have all that baggage of your business from a, well, this is the way I've always done it. You know, what what would you want it to be like? Like it's yeah. it's okay. And even though that seems like a weird thing for an accountant to say, sometimes it's those mentalities that really limit a business owner. Like, well, I can't change the the billing for that customer. I I can't. Well, why can't you? I mean, like, it's a Mm -hmm. limiting belief system in there. Like, well, I can't. They're going to get upset. Well, will they? They're professionals. Mm -hmm. They're adults. You can have a conversation and say, hey, I'd like to find a better way to set this up for you and for me. It makes more sense. Like, they're going to have a conversation with you. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, I was going to go into the price of coffee doubling, but our prices didn't double. Hmm. How did it say? Tell me, your th- tell me your thoughts uh, along the lines of pricing. Tell you, tell me your thoughts or your approach to like, uh, like value pricing. Oh man. Okay. Well, I am a student of Ron Baker, uh, and he's definitely more, I think, famous in the world of accounting. Um, he is often referred to in the accounting profession as the father of value pricing. So he like started value pricing in like 1995 in the world of public mm-hmm. accounting. When everybody else was billing by the hour, he was really um, wanting to drive his pricing based on um, to, up on the value that was created. And and uh, when I first started uh, becoming a student of his, this was maybe like, I don't know, five, seven years ago or something like that. I was like, 1995, like I had just graduated from high school and this man was doing value pricing. And like, we've been billing by the hour for how long? Like, 
mind blown. Anyway, value pricing to me is, and and ultimately, uh, even where Ron Baker starts to teach is, um, is even the subscription pricing is getting more focused on those outcomes as mm-hmm. opposed to the amount of time something takes. Really, yeah, yeah. clients, my clients, and every other you know customer on this planet really want some type of outcome from that product or service that they're buying. There's a reason that they're yeah, buying yeah. it, and that price in their mind, and they're willing to pay more if that problem gets solved faster, if it's more effective, if in their mind the perception of that solution is just easier to them, less stress, less friction, yeah. all of those things. And so um, I would encourage anybody who is grappling with pricing, especially people trying to make that leap from maybe hourly pricing to value pricing to subscription, to mm-hmm. go read everything you can that Ron Baker has published. And he's I've been on a million podcasts and everything. He's like brilliant when it comes to value pricing. And I, I'm a huge proponent. Uh, in my previous firm that I worked at, we moved everything to value pricing, despite all of those. Well, we can't do that. Like, the, are you sure we can do that? Mm-hmm. Everything got moved to value pricing, billed monthly. There was accounts receivable got eliminated. It's possible. How do you do that? I mean, how do you how do you go from how do you make that transition? Um, well, you say we're going to change this, <laughs> and you change it, um, <laughs> and you just start. I mean, it's. I know that sounds super. Like, I'm. I feel like a kind of simplify that like but it is sort of like a choice just like anything else of saying we're changing the the structure and we this is the model right so you're kind of modeling it out of Mm -hmm. hey instead of charging by the hour we are going to have this scope of services perhaps a menu of services um, and or products Mm -hmm. or bundles or things like that that get kind of grouped together and there's prices on it and those prices you kind of roll that out to your customers and I think it's communication and talking about it and eff- effectively yeah. conveying why this is better for the customer and why it enables them to be served in a better way. And when yeah. when they understand that, I don't I don't think most people resist that type of those types of changes. They're they're like, okay, that sounds good. Like they, they want, they probably want more from you anyway, if you're providing a service anyway, they're probably like excited to have an option to, to get more from you. Yeah. So, I mean, but I, th- I th- the other side to that though, is, is like actually setting that pricing, you know, I mean, are you setting it against like, you know, competitive businesses? Are you looking, what, what do you, what do you, where, what's the basis for it? Well, that's a good question. Um, well, price is totally subjective, right? I mean, if you think about it, uh, I think one of my the greatest yeah. examples that I've heard is like, you know, like a can of soda at like Sam's or Costco is like five cents, right? If you were to mm-hmm. buy a bunch of them. Um, if you go to the gro- regular grocery store, it might be a quarter, right? You go to a fast food restaurant and it might be, you know, $2. You go to... AT&T Stadium down here in Dallas on the day of a, you know, Cowboys game, and you're probably going to be paying $10 for that same soda, right? So mm-hmm. the price is relative depending upon when um, someone needs it, the, mm-hmm. you know, their, their perceived value and, you know, how, mm-hmm. like how thirsty they are, when they, where they are, where they need it for, the timing, all those things. I mean, uh, to me, that's the one thing you have to look about pricing. Where do you sit in that span, right? There's such a large, I guess what makes sense to me is to be really thinking about what, where I want to be positioned in, to, in relative to the competitors, right? Yeah. Do I want to be, um, is this a, is this a more cost uh, effective service? So it's a just a production oriented thing, or is this more of a concierge level or a very exclusive type of service or product where the price is going to be a lot higher and it's not going to be right for everybody. You know, there's just such a large range of where that could be. But uh, I think that depends on the brand you're trying to build and where you want to, where you personally, the business you want to build to fit into that span yeah 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 i guess as a buyer you know we're, we're looking at that from the perspective of of roi um you know we're spending the money and we're saying hey you know what as a result of that you know we should expect 
you know, X, Y, Z. I mean, what is, what is the, what is a way? What's a, what's a, what's a practical way to, to go about like this buying process? Oh, so as someone who is purchasing those services, uh, or products, man, I, you know, I think that's an interesting question just to think about like maybe psychologically. And this is definitely not my area of expertise, but I feel like <laughs> the mind of the buyer is a weird thing. I mean, we've all done this before. I mean, yeah. like how many times have you gone to a restaurant or something and you're like, uh, you bought a crazy expensive bottle of wine, right? Because you wanted to, maybe it was a special occasion or you had guests in town or it was a really important customer who you were entertaining, whatever. And then there's been other times yeah, running your grocery yeah. store and you're like seven ninety nine for that bottle of wine. I'm not buying that. <laughs> like, <Right. laughs> I, I, I think the bottom line is that buyers are just what they're, they're strange. You know what I mean? So we have to um, we have to approach the the buyer maybe from a situational standpoint, right? Yeah. And how do we try to replicate the mindset that they're in every time they are purchasing this particular like it, like thing, it. right? So we can get them to yeah. consistently because if you had had a really awesome bottle of wine at a restaurant with your friends or your colleagues or something. And then you saw that bottle in a grocery store, you actually might pay more for it. And you're like, Oh, I remember that experience. That was so, that was a really good bottle of wine. Maybe the wine wasn't any better than anything else, but you've associated things to it now. And that it changes your perception. A lot of it just has to do with the personal experiences of the buyer. So I guess that would reinforce maybe even more why it's important. And so many people focus on the experiential aspects of their brand mm -hmm. and their service and their product because it will garner a higher price because people have yeah. those associations yeah. in their mind. So, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's great. I, I, I felt like I heard you put your marketing cap on. So that degree. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. We need to like scurry back over to the accounting stuff. <laughs> Let's do that. So, so I get the other part of return on investment, or not the other part, but you know, I mean, directly related to that. So in the same way, you know, we're going out about our hiring process, you know, and so we're saying, you know, a certain person that we want to bring into your organization or a certain role, you know, has to have a certain return on investment. And I don't know that we always think that way, but you know, how, how do you, um, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? How do you kind of structure that uh, for the win? Well, I feel like this is probably the area where most business owners struggle when it comes to the people side of things because it is mm -hmm. it feels so much more personal. You know, if it if there was no subjective pieces to this, like I like you, right? Um, I like mm -hmm. you as a person. You're a good person. Like um, then it would be a lot easier to make decisions about people. Um, mm -hmm. but unfortunately, uh, that's not the case, right? We have, we have all these other emotions associated with things. So I'll, I'll give you an example. That's probably a little bit more accounting related. So business owner starts a business. They hire a person who works in their office, who does their books and all these other things, right? Been with them a long time. Mm -hmm. Business starts to grow, uh, mm -hmm. starts to scale you know, like they start investing in other people, right? But this one person in their office who manages like maybe the financial aspect of things, they just don't have the skill set to keep up with maybe the complexity of the accounting, the cash flow forecasting, yeah. uh, maybe some of these are yeah. the sophisticated yeah. things like helping drive the strategy of the, the financial aspects, the banking relationships. I mean, there's so much that goes on, right? So yeah. owners like, but I can't get rid of them because they... They helped me when my business was small, right? They have this yeah. po this emotional, sentimental, personal attachment to that individual, even though they know in their minds that person cannot do the job I need them to do. That is the one of the biggest struggles with business owners. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. I would just say that that's probably the piece they need to learn to get over a little faster. They need to thank that person for their time and effort for helping them so much, but they're truly doing their business a disservice and probably that person too, um, yeah, by yeah. trying to get them to do something that maybe they never even really wanted to do. They've now just being forced yeah. into this new yeah. role. I mean, a totally different situation. Maybe if they're like, I'm going back to school to get my accounting degree. I'm going to be a CFO. I've got my CPA license. I mean, like if they're growing with the organization, that's one thing, but if they're just 
you know, so many uh, times I see like a bookkeeper who's got a CFO title and no qualifications in between. And so that can be a real challenge. So I would tell people this, really think about your motivations and your intentions and be honest with yourself about whether employing that individual is serving you or serving your business. Yeah. And sometimes you got to do hard things, but choose your hard. Yeah, that's 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 a, that's a very painful um, situation and and conversation, you know, when it has to happen. I think I think I think there's I think there's another piece to that though. You know, when when I think about um, developers, for example, you know, uh, we we have uh, developers on our team, and you know they're paid you know uh, on a salary, you know, and they have to do if they have to produce a certain amount of work you know, over the course of, you know, a month or whatever. And, and if they don't do that, you know, that causes problems for the company. Obviously, we have to provide the work, you know, but there's definitely a, almost an objective line, you know, that I can say, okay, we've got to bill, you know, X number of hours per month. You know, is, is, yeah. that, is that an atypical or a typical approach? Well, I think it's always great to have metrics. If, an, uh, if any of your listeners are fans of EOS or the Entrepreneurial Operating System, I mean, the number one thing mm -hmm. it says in there is that everybody's got a number and you manage to that number. So, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's good to have those types of uh, metrics in place. Um, but on that same side, like there's like other valuations like, yes, metrics are important, right? Um Mm -hmm. However, there's also like the, you know, idea of do they fit in with your culture, your follow your mission, yeah. you know, your core values. Yeah. And do yeah. they, you know, if you follow EOS is they also ask for like, um, you know, the plus or minus uh, on the, do they get it? Do they want it? Do they have the capacity for it? And those are good yeah. measurements too. Um, and sometimes that is more subjective, but maybe I, I like Rick, I like your approach here of thinking and kind of balancing out the subjective with the objective, right? Um, I, I, mm -hmm. I think it's important to look at results for sure, but I think it's also important to not discount the fact that if someone's not delivering results, um, even though they may fit in culturally, like from a core values and stuff, like you got to do what's in the best interest of the company, yeah. even if they're a good yeah. person. And I get it. You know, it's hard. It's tough. Those, those are your, those are your most difficult decisions, but the best interest of the company, what serves the company, that's really becomes the more important question. And those things show up in the financials and the bottom line and the production and all the other elements of the things that you're trying to build. Oh yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, I, I always look at it like everybody else in the company is looking for me to make the right decisions. You know what I mean? Everybody else has family. So if I'm not making good decisions, you know, it, it, it kind of triple it actually trickles down not even kind of <laughs> yeah. it will force it's like directly correlated right like mm -hmm. exactly. absolutely absolutely now you 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 like to talk about return on stuff what what are the areas of the business um do, do we want to look take a hard look at you know really with uh, when we're looking at returns and when we start talking about returns i say i say what does return on accountant look like is what i say um, a lot of people say, oh, accountants, you know, those fees you pay, professional fees, or even, you know, if it's a line item in your salaries, right, that is an expense. It's kind of a sunk cost and it's kind of like a necessary evil maybe is the way mm -hmm. that, you know, most people view accounting. Um, I say that is a fallacy. That is wrong. Really, accounting is an opportunity center and not a cost center. There are there's so many possibilities to glean insights, to obtain data, to understand the potential of a business when you start using the accounting function in the best way. So yeah. when, you know, I think I, a lot of people will spend the bare minimum, like just get it done for tax prep or just give me enough to satisfy the bank so they're happy, right? And instead of really thinking through strategically, how can I use this function to give me all the information that I need to make this business the best I can it can be? And how can mm -hmm. I leverage that? And truly, the accounting records are the greatest source of data. There's so much of mm -hmm. They are just rich with data. Um, and in a lot of cases, it's just not used. Nobody ever looks at it. Um, so, I mean, I think it could be anything from like thinking about the types of projects that you work on. So if you know you make a lot of money, maybe your most significant 
profit is from one particular product or one particular profit uh, project type or something like that. How mm -hmm. do you sell more of those, right? Where is that business coming from? What is the origin of it? Is it purchased with something else? Like really starting to connect those dots and understanding yeah. how can we drive more of that? And if we do, what does that do to the bottom line, right? So getting a little bit more thoughtful about that. I think so many times people are expecting um, like, uh, I don't know, maybe a uh, the basic function of accounting to yield that information, like, or, or maybe there's maybe thinking it's magical, <laughs> like, like, <laughs> it happen. but that's why it's so important to invest in that accounting function and the people who are running that function to help you to connect those dots and help you to really make those, those, um, those inferences from the data to the potential yeah, for yeah. the business. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I've, I've seen where accountants have come in. I actually had a friend, you know, that walked into a company. He's like, "Look, I can save you enough money to make my salary, you know, to to pay me, you know." And he, he um, you know, did that whole, you know, this is the value that you know what I'm uh, offering you is worth. And it's like, okay, and then we can grow from here because I can show you where to invest, how to evaluate all of your, um, you know, all of your different operational functions, et cetera, et cetera. That's it's it it makes sense you know it makes sense what what do you see is um keeping people kind of kind of on that fence though you know it's like it seems like hey you know what i need to call susan today you know right after listening to the show and and make and make this happen but i mean what is what do you see as, as uh the blockers for folks i think it's a combination of things one i think it's not fully understanding the capacity at which accountants can function um, I think that's mm -hmm. one. And there's been a, there's a lot of, even in our profession, there's a lot of professionals who just don't do the things that they say they're going to do, or they don't know how to do them. They hold themselves out to do something that they can't. So I think that's one, that's one of one aspect is just finding the right person for your business is a locating yeah, that person yeah. who truly can help you in the best way possible. So I think, and yeah. that's hard for business owners because what time do they have to go out there and find that person, right? So they're dreaming of yeah. this person. I know that they are. <laughs> they're like, if only I could find somebody who could do this for me. Yes. Um, they're out there. Ask around. Talk to people. You know, this is not necessarily you going onto Indeed or, you know, one of those job posting or even LinkedIn or something and searching for somebody. It's yeah. um, getting a referral from somebody who's seen that person in action. So start there. Yeah, I think that's the first thing that's holding them back. The second piece of it is, is that it's, um, it's investing, it's investing in themselves and investing more in the business. Uh, yeah. It is perceived to be, like I said, it's like, oh, look, I just need tax returns and get my books updated. Like, that's enough. I'll, I'll try to figure out the rest. And so they're trying to piecemeal this function instead of really harnessing it. So it takes yeah. money yeah. to invest it to make it right. Um, I just don't think they've ever really spent enough money on it to know how good it can be and how yeah. much stress it really will take off of them. That value yes. proposition that we talked about in the beginning, like mm -hmm. I've, they've, they've just never felt that before. And once you yeah. feel yeah. the benefit of it's handled, that's handled, that's handled. I don't have to worry about sales tax, payroll taxes. I don't have to worry about cash flow. I don't have to worry about billing. I don't have to worry about my books being done. Bankers happy. IRS is happy. Nobody's on my, you know, <laughs> right in my butt. And I'm able to go and focus on the thing where I can make more money. That freedom, that emotional bandwidth and mental capacity that gets freed, they've never experienced yeah. it. And so they don't know that it's worth putting some money into it to be free from that. But that's a, that is a freedom unlike anything else. Uh, it's just, <laughs> it, it, it is, uh, cause this is stuff that weighs them down. I mean, I, how many times have you wake, you know, woke up in the middle of the night and you're like, Oh my gosh, did that get billed? Did that get paid? Uh, did that vendor get paid? Did that customer make a payment? Like, you got payroll, right? Like, whoa, do I have enough money to make that pay? I mean, these are real things. I myself as a business owner, I mean, I've uh, we've all had our struggles um, as a business owner. We know the things that keep us up. And number one yeah. is, yeah. is it's customers and money, right? Cust customers and money, like, like, did we get the customer handled? Because I need the money. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're, they're, right, they're always <laughs> buying for the top spot there. But um, 
there's a better way for the money to be handled, knowing that if you can go focus on those customer activities, whether product or service, it does not matter. If you can be innovative, you can be the real visionary you were meant to be, you will make more money if you focus your time on effort on the things you're great at versus trying to kind of, you know, band-aid a broken accounting function. Um, and that goes for any other function in your business too. Marketing, ops, I mean, we, we see it all. I'm sure you've seen it too, right? I mean, invest, invest in that business, you know? Absolutely. Wow. Wow. <laughs> that was great. That was, that was absolutely great. Thank you for that. I think, I, th- I think everybody's going to get a lot of value out of, you know, just what you said in, in, in the, in the last clip. That was, um, that was amazing. Cool. So in, what what should someone expect i guess from you know from from the accountant so they go out you know they find that person that they've been dreaming of um, so to speak of what what is the expectation you know what is that um, you know what do we expect in terms of quality what do we expect in terms of um, you know potential engagement which you know talking about you know a company that's not going to be hiring a full time you know accounting function in, in their business but somebody that is going to bring in someone like you and say okay you know what I need to just turn this over you know what what should what should they be looking for you know and how do you know when you've got a you know a, a bad egg so to speak mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah I love that I love that cool cool awesome awesome thank you for that um, so you have you have a giveaway uh, that we talked about. What you want to tell the audience about that? Cool, awesome, awesome. Yeah, we'll definitely put those links in the show notes so anybody uh, watching the show or listening to the show can can check that out, and hopefully we'll get a bunch of downloads for you. And if they want to get in touch with you, what's what's the best way to do that? That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Susan. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for uh, being on the show. Hope to uh, talk to you. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Folks, make sure you tune into the next episode of the Relentless Pursuit of Winning podcast, and we'll see you then, okay? Take care. Right. Thank you so much.